Thank you, everybody. Unfortunately, the chair has some IT problems, so I'm going to take over for a short period. Um, I just wanted to ask councillors um, if there are any more questions that they'd like to ask uh, on this decision before we go into debate. So it's the last chance for us to ask questions before we formally move into the debate. It looks as though we've got no questions and it looks like we've got our chair back who can ask for a proposal. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so do I have a proposal, please? Yes, chair, I'd like to propose. Thank you, Councillor Bourne. And do I have a seconder, please? Happy to, happy to second, Councillor Campbell. OK, thank you, Councillor Bicknell. So to debate, who it would like to start off the debate? Councillor Tyson Payne, thank you. OK, so I've read loads. I've listened to a bucket load of stuff. And, and, and I'm now in the, these are my thoughts. I can't get my head around local traffic issues because I can't see how putting more traffic on roads that are already over um, dealt with, um, overmanned can actually not have an impact. I know of times when I have sat on Southampton Road and we all know we had um, a council, couple of council meetings that never actually got off on time because we were all stuck in traffic. So I have an issue with the traffic on the local roads. Um, I don't think the argument has been made for the jobs because I think it's too tied up in the COVID stuff. Um, and I have real issues with the noise and the carbon. Uh, um, so, so those are my concerns. Um, uh, I hear what the airport are saying. Um, I think they are genuine. Um, not that I would say they weren't genuine, but you know they put a good case across. But I'm not. I'm not convinced. So convince me, somebody. Okay. So, uh, Councillor Bicknell, you you were next. You wanted to say something. Yes, thank you, Chair. I've got um, a reasonable amount to say because I've made copious notes today that are scattered all around my desk. So um, but first of all, I'd like to start by thanking everyone who has taken part in this application um, today and, and, and the length of time that they, they, they've sat through it um, as members of the public um, a, a, as well. Um, this has generated unsurprisingly a lot of interest um, and given that this is such a mon monumentous decision that will shape our area for gener generations to come, it is very refreshing that we've had such, um, such input from members of the public. Um, I'd also like to thank all the staff involved for all their hard work, dedication and commitment in what has become um, a life consuming event. So this is a very complex application that doesn't just affect Eastleigh or is even just relevant to Eastleigh. This application also affects our surrounding area, places such as Southampton and Bishopstoke, and has, and has implications in the much wider southern region, or south region. With this application, we have far more to consider than the conventional planning applications that we are normally used to, as well as the usual 
DC Borough Council Safe Policies and the National Planning Policy Framework, which we are relatively useful, use, used to. We also have the addition of national government policies in the form of the Aviation Policy Framework, the Airport's National Policy Statement, and the Making Best Use of ex Existing Runways, along with Aviation 2050, Climate Change Act, and the Paris Agreement, and the recommendations and considerations of the Climate Change Committee, all things that we obviously need to take into account. None of these things can be taken in isolation or on their own. Um, and as such, as members today, we are actually we're, we're dancing between numerous detailed and not always straightforward policies, as has already been mentioned, some of which all you know do conflict. Um, before I actually start my deliberations, I would like to say that none of us uh, are taking whatever decision we make lightly. This has been all consuming, exhausting and highly pressured. Um, and as members, we have to look at all the evidence presented with no one area being a decisive factor in isolation. Despite all the legislation and guidance, planning decisions are hardly ever black and white. Um, instead, it's a balance based on the evidence that's presented. This is certainly no exception. So whatever decision any member takes, it will be a balanced one based on all the evidence taken after an awful lot of deliberation. So, but due to the nature of the report, report it's impossible um, to, to actually take it as a whole. So I'm going to go through uh, my deliberations that I've been jotting down um, in, in, in report order. <clears throat> so we have to take into account the ANPS, which is a government policy uh, and a policy that the government actually believes are not increasing capacity of airports will actually cost the economy uh, between anywhere between 30 and 45 billion over the next 60 years. And government in this policy are actually in favour of controlled expansion. The making best use of uh, um, you know, existing um, airports and runways, uh, another government policy. Uh, and paragraph 1.15 um, actually states that under trading, um, um, under carbon trading, UK aviation emissions could con continue to grow, providing compensatory reductions are made actually in the global economy because the government favours dealing with aviation on the global, um, um, on, 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 you know, globally. Um, but equally for the UK, it could be that aviation is facilitated by the trading of carbon from other sectors. So the UK emissions for aviation um, don't actually impact, impact globally. And then there's the APF. Um, and um, that actually says that um, aviation is 6% total of greenhouse emissions of the 22% um, transport sector. And as other sectors decrease, then the, the percentage of aviation is likely to increase. So we have those three government policies to take into account. And from the report, um, then um, you know, the report is written and, and, and this report, you know, we adhere to, to those policies. There's then a whole host of um, local council policies um, that um, uh, on various chapters um which i won't go through but generally we're actually um you know the, the report um we adhere to them um and we're here to the you know, um, comments that have been made already by um by, by andy granfield and um, um members for the airport with reference to policy um so that then brings us to um starting to brings us to some of the the big issues um, with this application. And um, the first one is the uh, social economic side of things um, and, and, and the business case um, and, and the direct jobs. Given the lateness, um, I'm not going to go line by line through all the notes that I've written and pulled out of the report as we've been sat here today. But I will do my best to try and find what I've written down as the conclusions. Uh, um, but um, on, the, on the business side and the social economics, um, I agree with the officer's recommendation um, that actually in the long term, 
there'd be a, you know, a benefit not just to Eastley and, and um, the surrounding area, but to the actual Solent, um, the, uh, the whole Solent region. And this isn't just based on the direct jobs that will be um, created at the airport, and it won't just actually be the taxi rank outside the, the railway station that's picking up um, 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 passengers that have you know, um, just got off a plane or, or, or they're just dropping them off. Um, and this isn't just people that are actually in the supply chain of, uh, of um, um, and the airport. This is all the businesses that have absolutely nothing to do with the airport, but are actually based in and around the area because of the airport. Um, and that of which we've had numerous emails and has obviously been picked up by a number of speakers today whose names I, I honestly cannot remember. Um, um, but obviously we had the Chamber of um, Commerce um, speak and, you know, and we've heard numerous people speak on those. Um, so from the, you know, the, the economic side and also the job side and that, that job side and that employment is vitally important coming out of COVID. Um, and at the same time, it also you know, jobs do also have an impact on people's health. We'll be going into debating and talking about health um, later on. But if you haven't got a job, then there's health impacts there. If you haven't got employment um, at the end of the day. So jobs are vitally important, not just for the economy, but also for people's health and well-being um, and supporting their families. Um, and that's so. Um, so whilst I talk about um, or have been talking about health, I'm going to move on to noise. I'm going to sort of start in reverse order. At the end of the day, it's, it's admitted in the report that it's not possible to mitigate on the outdoor spaces for noise. OK, um, if you're outside, you can't mitigate. Um, I brought up earlier um, about some um, some you know, soundscaping at Skipol Airport. Um, so it's a possibility, but um, basically you can't you can't mitigate. We've seen the the contours, um, and um, and and we've seen all the detail in the report, and we we've, we've looked at all the um, um, you know all, all the figures and the number of people that are uh, being affected are actually in the report in the tables. And if it wasn't as they as as it was written, then it would be unacceptable, and that would be unacceptable for some of the um, aviation policies from government. It would also be unacceptable for our own policies, but there is mitigation in place, which then bring that. So therefore it brings it down from the unacceptable and noise then becomes part of the planning balance and not something that can be taken in its own right in a planning determination. It's a balance. So the airport have gone above and beyond the minimum requirement. And the mitigation is in place. And now it comes down to planning balance. Um, you know, I, I agree with what's been written with the report. Um, it does meet the aviation policy framework because it, it, you know, it's a limit and where possible does reduce the number of people in the UK significantly affected by aircraft noise. Um, the keys are with these phrases in the policies, it's limit where possible. They're not absolutes. So that's my views on noise. Working on to the air quality, um, the air quality is a difficult chapter to to to, to get um, to grips with grip because it's very technical. But generally, overall, I again I agree with the the officer recommendation that the effects on air quality are are negligible um, as per the report um, um, at at, great, at ambient at ambient level, um, and that and and and. I agree with the obviously a lot of the air quality also uh, is not just the aviation, but is actually the, the traffic coming in. You know, this 2.4 million people, 2.45 million people that are coming to the airport. We have had we have seen in the report the modelling um, and we've had the reports and the recommendations um, um, from Hampshire County Council has the Highway Authority and Highways England with reference to the motorway network and the trunk roads that they deal with. And they have categorically said that there is not that there is no issue with, um, you know, uh, with, with the highway. They have no objections up to the three million um, passengers per annum. And that a lot of that is because that the peak times for an airport 
is not the hour what we would normally be dealing with the peak times, i.e. 8 till 9 o'clock or 5 till 6 o'clock. The peak time of the airport traffic is outside of those times and is more spread out. Um, so I agree with the, the recommendations um, from, 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 from highways because they are the experts. They know far more about um, traffic modelling than, than any of us do. Um, I've looked through the chapter on biodiversity um, and again, it's a recommendation from our officers that uh, southern damselfly, otters and fish, no, um, um, you know, no, no adverse effect on, uh, effect on any of those, all, all, the, all, all, the, all the river rich inducer NOx um, deposits and such like. So I'm happy with the biodiversity. I'm happy with the air quality. I'm happy with um, um, the, uh, the, the transport. Um, the noise, as I say, is part of the planning balance. Then perhaps we then come to perhaps the biggest one, climate change. And we've heard all about the climate change. Um, and I agree that we need to do everything we possibly can to minimise the emissions that the airport can control, um, which is obviously their ground operations. But I, 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 I say some of the detail I can't quite remember, and I'm sure you don't really want me going back through the report and looking at particular paragraphs to quote to you. But it's been stated about the fact that um, global emissions, um, sorry, at the airport emissions, the government take them globally. And I've been looking at the reports, I'm quite happy, or as happy as I can be, um, that the small percentage of greenhouse gases that will be emitted by the airport means that the government will have to reduce something elsewhere because it's not a significant increase from the two million passengers per annum to the three million passengers per annum. So the, um, and, and then, of course, when it comes to the sixth carbon budget and the recommendations, and they are recommendations of the Climate Change Committee, then that is up to government how they actually um, carve that up um, at the end of the day. But climate change also features very, very much in Eastie Borough Council's um, climate emergency declaration. And that is important. But when you actually look at that side of things with the um, Eastie Borough Council's climate emergency, most of the greenhouse gases that are going to be emitted as a result of this application are actually not going to be Eastie Borough Council. Because most of the greenhouse gases are actually emitted from the aircraft on landing and takeoff and climb, cruise and descent. So therefore that brings back the climate change side of things is not going to be something that Easy Borough Council can control. So we're actually not in breach of our, our, our climate change emergency, but it does make very relevant the steps that the national that government need to take to control climate change because it's a you know it's a national stroke global issue because aircraft move and obviously they move in three dimensions so i i i i i feel that easley's climate emergency declaration hasn't been breached because it, because of those reasons both the climate change and the noise aspect they're all, they're both worst case scenarios because neither take into account um the, the possibility of quieter aircraft, uh, neither take into account the possibility that Eastley Airport may um, have, you know, get a 220s. Um, they've made their assumptions based on 320s and 737s, but obviously they're a business, so they'll take whatever they can get. So, so they're both worst case scenarios, which is the right thing to do, and it's the right thing for us to be debating on the fact they are worst case scenarios, but they might not be that bad, um, but we can't judge it on that. And then of course, with both of them, there's new technology. Um, engines are getting quieter, um, which we know, and of course, then there's new, um, carbon emissions from new engines. I mean, obviously a jet engine emits less um, carbon than, than a prop engine and a jet engine and a larger aircraft is more efficient per passenger than a smaller aircraft and a, and a prop aircraft. 
hydrogen is is being looked at um, and uh, it's been mentioned previously that some um, airbus have perhaps some concept designs i don't quite know how far advanced they are but it's not just hydrogen but it's also um reported by bloomberg hydrogen group um biofuels fuel from waste reported by the bbc and there's other ways to deal with potential carbon that are being looked at and one of them is direct carbon capture which was reported by national geographic and this loosely and basically is fans that draw air into an organic filter that which one that is then full gets heated to 100 degrees which releases the carbon it's mixed with water it's pumped underground and then the natural the natural rock reacts with it and turns it into stone this is actually already on trial um, in, um, by a Swiss company called Climeworks in Helisheide, probably not pronounced like that, but that's how it's, it's spelled. Um, and of course, the plants actually run on, re on renewables. So whilst technology can help um, and will help, it's not going to be um, short term because, as has been said, aviation takes a long time because of the nature of its business. But aviation as has already been said, cannot be uninvented. It is here to stay, just the same as the internet is here to stay, which also actually uses more carbon than the um, air, um, aviation industry, just as the motor cars are here to stay. The motor cars changing, aviation will catch up. So aviation actually helps quite a lot of, I, I'm personally not against aviation. It needs to get cleaner, it needs to get better. Because aviation actually supports across the globe countless countries and communities through tourism and that actually comes back into our own country and our own region i think you'll find that places like buckingham palace and stonehenge have more foreign tourists visiting than they do english people and they don't all come here by train and boat or walk so aviation has a part to play in the global economy and actually keeping nations um, afloat um, because if they don't have tourists some of these places don't have food. So I shall leave it at that point. There's a lot of other things to be uncovered. Um, but um, taking everything into account, then at, at this moment in time, I'm minded to support the recommendation and support the airport extension. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bicknell. We're now going to Councillor Clark. OK, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I, I would echo the gratitude at the start of that. So I would thank everyone as well. Thank all the councillors um, for their efforts today and through the whole process, because this has been going on for quite a long time. We've all been looking into a lot of information about the airport. Thank all the officers and staff that have been involved in the report and setting up today's meeting and for making sure that it has gone successfully. And for all the members of the public, um, thank you to all the members of the public who have had a say. I've listened and I've reflected um, throughout that, not just today, but also throughout the um, lead up to today as I've read all the information and listened to people that have got in touch with me. So I have come to quite a clear decision. So I would just like to emphasise that that decision has come after a lot of thought and reflection. So. I, I cannot support this application. I will be voting to refuse it. And my reasoning is broadly based on the climate emergency. So early in this meeting, it was established that the declaration of a climate emergency is not an overriding decider. But it's a material consideration to be considered alongside other material considerations in a balancing process. Now, the issue for me is following that guidance when I put the climate emergency on one side of the scales there are not material considerations I can see that are weighty enough in my opinion to put into the opposing side of the, of the argument that balance it out um, I'm afraid that for me for reasons that I'll explain um, the climate emergency is too big a consideration to be outweighed by the arguments in favour of this application. So a resident said, earlier said, we owe it to young people and future generations to make difficult decisions today. And I completely agreed with that because it is a difficult decision. Um, when there you know, is 
a lot of emotion around. There's heavy messaging in the community that a major employer could potentially go, although we have established today that that is not what we're deciding on, that we are working on the basis that the airport will continue without this extension. But when there is that emotional environment, it is a difficult decision. And, you know, I've got a lot of admiration for the staff at the airport. I've, you know, it's been um, very worthwhile listening to them. And so it is difficult to take a vote which is going against what they're saying. But um, I do think that the long term considerations over the climate outweigh the short term benefits. And, you know, that argument could be summed up by some of the words that Chris Packham sent to us last night when he said that, you know, we might get jobs today um, as a result of this extension, but we'll be doing so by putting literally everything in danger in the future. You know, we're not looking too far into the future of this planet where we will be seeing, you know, young people not just having their jobs at risk, but everything, um, you know, in their planet put at risk. So I do not accept that the argument that the that will that the emissions that will come as a result of this extension are so in, insignificant that the climate issue shrinks against the po promised socio-economic benefits. It has been said earlier today that the aviation industry accounts for six to seven percent of greenhouse gases across the UK and we were advised that within that six to 7%, this particular development represents 1% of aviation um, emissions. However, leaving aside the fact that this percentage of the UK's overall GHGs will increase as other sectors get cleaner fa faster than the aviation industry, the argument that because we're not solving the whole crisis from a single vote, a single act, um, that means that we shouldn't bother taking that action at all. Uh, it just doesn't stand up in an emergency. In an emergency, you do everything and you vote every way you can, um, whether it's for a big or small measure, to you know save our planet. And if you scale up the argument that um, because this is a relatively small uh, percentage of the UK's emissions, uh, we shouldn't we should overlook it, then you get to the sort of argument that climate deniers used to put across. You know, there was a long period where people denied the science on climate change, but then when we eventually got over that, people started to say, well, we're just the UK, we're a small country, so let's not do anything because, you know, the bigger countries won't do anything, so let's not do anything at all. We we got over that argument because that argument just doesn't stand up. Everybody should do what they can to, um, to avert this crisis. So we have to be careful that some... Uh, of some of the suggestions that would almost make this seem, you know, this extension seem something that is actually beneficial to uh, the um, fight against climate change. It's already been dismissed that it is greener to travel and fly from Southampton Airport than it is um, from other airports. So that was dismissed earlier when in our questioning. I think it was this morning. It was quite a long time ago. Well, yesterday, but no, it's still this morning. Um, it's quite a long time ago, but I'm, I think that was dismissed. Not only has this been dismissed, it, the argument's been established today that this extension will actually increase demand. So we're going to be encouraging more people to fly at a time when the technology is still such that it means greater emissions. It's been argued that the airport itself will become carbon neutral, so the functions at the actual airport. But that will just save a tiny fraction of the additional emissions caused by the extension, which will be 370,000 additional tonnes a year. So hybrid and electric planes are a long way off. Over the next 10 years, 3.7 million tonnes will be emitted on top of the emissions from flights from the airport already. And it's important to remember um, that it's been established today that the airport um, will continue. So it's not a wildly radical position to say that we don't want to go down the road where we're going to have those 3.7 million extra tonnes of carbon over the next year, 10 years, because the airport will still exist. It's just saying that we should not accept the increase in emissions because the promised benefits uh, don't justify that increase. 
So my last few points bring me to the console T responses because we have been told today to give a lot of weight to those people who wrote in support, even though you know really we sh should be sticking to um, the planning rules, planning guidelines. Um, many of those people who wrote in support were basing their support on a, on avoiding the collapse of the airport. But we have seen today that the airport is viable without the extension. And I think also it's probably only today that it's been made absolutely clear that the argument that it's greener to travel to Southampton Airport and fly from there, and therefore that justifies this extension, uh, then it is to fly from other airports. Uh, it's just not credible that, you know, we've sort of accepted that today. But I think that during the during the process of the consultation, a lot of people were of the view that actually by extending at Southampton, we're going to be helping the environment. And I, I don't think that that has stood up today. So we need to bear that in mind when we look at a lot of those people who wrote in support, because a lot of people who wrote in support did mention that and maybe they would have had the same view um, if it was made clear to them, you know, what, what's been said today, but maybe they wouldn't. Additionally, it's been noticeable to me that people who support the extension have included the argument that technology will solve the problems of a problem of emissions with electric planes. But as was brought to our attention earlier today, this technology is deco decades away. OK, and it will not avoid the massive increase in emissions caused by this extension in the coming years of this emergency when we urgently need to reduce emissions. So clearly the reasons why the climate emergency prevent me supporting this um, are primarily environmental, but there are also an economic consequences that would result from um, increased carbon emissions. So a speaker earlier illustrated the economic impacts of um, the damage of climate change by likening not acting on climate change. Um, sorry, a speaker earlier tackled the issue of the economic impacts that are going to come if we don't do anything about climate change. And to illustrate that, she um, used an analogy which I believe originated with Mark Carney, where she said that in the second half of this um, century, not acting on climate change will lead to economic impacts that will be equivalent to a coronavirus a year. OK, and I think that that's something that we need to bear in mind because the economic costs of this extension may not be suffered by today's decision makers. We may only be held to account over this decision by people who experience the short term socio-economic promised benefits, but on the basis of all the evidence about climate change, there are going to be heavy economic consequences to this, which will be um, experienced, even if um, the people who experience it can't vote for us that um, are currently on the council. I think that in terms of being prudent on the economy, just look at the economic chaos that coronavirus has caused over the last year. You know, why wouldn't we do everything we could to try and avoid that sort of problem happening in the future, even if, you know, many of us aren't the ones that are going to bear the brunt of it. I think that economic growth is valuable to the extent that it's sustainable and that it improves people's lives and that it makes life better for future generations. Each generation should try and leave things better for the next. And I think this type of development represents economic growth which is not sustainable because it worsens the climate emergency and by extension it makes life worse for people and it creates a disaster for future generations and so whilst I totally agree, accept the sincerity of people that are arguing for the short-term socio-economic benefits I think that that long-term um, impact the long-term impacts um, outweigh those. Um, so obviously primarily I'm basing my vote to refuse on the climate emergency, but I also have been concerned by a couple of other things. I have seen over recent weeks talks talk about NIMBYs objecting. But the thing about NIMBYs to me is that the stereotype of a NIMBY is someone who is quite well off, who has very little to worry about and who complains about, uh, you know, minor inconveniences to them. But actually, in this case, you know, we've got a lot of people who um, might not necessarily speak up. In fact, a lot of people who are going to be directly um, impacted 
by the air quality and noise issues are people who are more likely to be vulnerable and who are less likely to feel empowered enough to get involved in this sort of um, debate today. So um, I, I'd just like to take issue with that mentioning of NIMBYs that I've heard because actually the people who are most impacted by this, they're not people that are suffering minor inconveniences. As we've seen, you know, they're people who are going to suffer from the effects of noise. You know, people who might need outdoor spaces for their mental health and for their well-being um, will be the ones who suffer most. But they've been generally quiet because people in that situation do not feel as empowered um, as many others in society to get involved in this sort of debate. So um, my primary reason for voting to refuse, it's based on my conscience, is uh, the climate emergency. However, I do have those concerns about air quality and noise and the impact that they have on the well-being and health of local residents. So I'll be voting for refusal. I hope I've fully explained my vote. It is quite late um, and I fully respect uh, the votes of my colleagues. Thank you, Councillor Clark. We are at midnight. Yes, Chair. And um, we did say that we would uh, stop the debate at midnight and we would reconvene tomorrow. Um, because we have been going for a very long time and it's it's not fair on on staff and and um, on my colleagues as well to to continue and this is such an important issue that it really does deserve the um, highest quality mm -hmm. debate and um, I must admit even my good self are, are, I'm finding it quite difficult to um, string together a coherent sentence at this stage so um, I'm going to call an end to tonight's session and we will be reconvening at 6 p.m. tomorrow evening. Thank you to everybody who has participated thus far and I'm really sorry that we weren't able to uh, finish it today but I hope you agree that this is a decision that needs proper and full consideration. Thank you very much and Thank I hope you, to Chair. see you tomorrow. Thank you, Chair, and you've done extremely Thank well you. today. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Chair. See you tomorrow evening. So serve everyone at six o'clock tomorrow.